All right, today we're going to talk about environmental epidemiology, uh, which is one of the most important topics in environmental health. Uh, today's class consists of two different modules. The, uh, the main topic in the first module is measuring disease morbidity. Then we will talk about uh, study designs in epidemiology, such as cross-sectional, case control, and cohort study designs. In the first module of the lecture, we will talk about measuring health morbidity, which is mainly uh, about first a brief history of environmental epidemiology, two important scientists in the history of environmental epidemiology who made a great contribution to the field, uh, then the basic concepts of the definition of environmental epidemiology, what is epidemiology, what is environmental epidemiology, and the major assumptions, then I will introduce you uh, some common research topics uh, in environmental epidemiology such as air pollution, climate change, and potable water. Uh, we will also uh, learn basic measures of disease frequency used in epidemiology such as incidence, prevalence, and then we will compare them using several examples. So. Uh, Let's briefly talk about the history of environmental epidemiology. Environmental epidemiology has a long history that dates back to 2000 or more years ago. In about 400 BC, the ancient Greek Hippocrates hypothesized that, uh, it was for the first time, that hypothesized that uh, environmental factors such as water quality and air condition uh, play a major role in causing the disease. It was kind of surprising for because people only believed in supernatural explanation for disease occurrence. And uh, he published a uh, well-known book named uh, On Airs, Water, and Places. And experts in epidemiology confirmed that his writing is uh, a foundation of environmental epidemiology uh, and called him the father of old epidemiology. So he hypothesized that maybe there is a relationship between disease occurrence and environmental factors rather than supernatural explanation that was common that time. Uh, let's look at some part of his book. Uh, I just summarized the most important parts. He states that uh, whoever wishes to investigate medicine properly should uh, proceed first place to uh, consider the season of the year, which implies climate condition, then the wind, the hot and the cold uh, countries, which implies location or geography. We should also consider the quality of water and uh, so forth. So you can see that he considered environmental factors as influential factors in explaining disease occurrence for the first time. Another well-known scientist uh, who made a great contribution to the field of epidemiology is John Snow, who is known as the father of modern epidemiology. Uh, during the 19th century, there was an outbreak of cholera in London. Cholera was a terrible disease who was killing so many people every day. Uh, no one could control it. People and physicians believed that it was because of the bad weather conditions. Uh, but John Snow noticed that most of the infected cases had used the water of a uh, pump in Broadway Street. So he hypothesized that maybe there is a relationship between occurrence of cholera and Broadway Street pump. But uh, to convince the policymakers, he needed facts. Uh, he collected data of the locations of the people who died because of cholera and also the location of handheld pumps and mapped the locations of pumps and locations of deaths and noticed that most of the cases clustered around the Broadway Street pump. And uh, by removing the handle of that pump, they were able to control the cholera in London. So uh, this is the map of location of deaths because of cholera. Uh, location of the pumps, most of the deaths, you can see that uh, most of the deaths occurred around the Broadway Street pump. 
Now let's move to the second part of this module and talk about the term epidemiology. Epidemiology is one of the fundamental disciplines used uh, in the study of environmental health. Epidemiology looks at the distribution like what we did in the first lab, spatial distribution of historical hazards. It also looks at the both the distribution of health outcomes such as diseases or mortality, morbidities, injuries, and also the distribution of factors that may explain disease occurrence such as climate change, trace metals, and so forth. So, and the question is, is there any association between health outcome and the hazards? So, uh, you may ask yourself in clinical medicine, we also uh, look for the relationship between health outcome and hazards, but what is the difference between clinical medicine and epidemiology? In clinical medicine, the focus is on individual patient, but epidemiology studies the disease pattern in entire population. That's why epidemiology is also called as population medicine. So in epidemiology, the focus is on both healthy and patients, but clinical medicine deals with only the patients. In epidemiological studies, for example, we want to uh, examine uh, lung cancer mortality across counties or census tract, not at individual level. So we're working with aggregated data or group data. Epidemiologists may want to determine whether lung cancer mortality is higher in areas with higher concentration of smoke tax industries in comparison with areas that have lower levels of air pollution. So that's the difference between clinical medicine and epidemiology. So uh, what is the definition of environmental epidemiology? It's uh, the study of disease pattern, of course, occurring in the population, not at individual level, but they are linked to environmental factors. Uh, there is another important assumption uh, for environmental epidemiology that exposure factors must lie outside the individual's immediate control. So let's see an example to better understand the concept. For example, do you think the study, uh, do you think studying the effects of smoking among individuals who smoke would be a concern of environmental epidemiology? No, it's not. And uh, how about exposure of population to secondhand as cigarette smoke or passive smoke. Yes, it is. It is a concern because uh, non-smokers and vulnerable groups such as children cannot control whether they are exposed to environmental tobacco smoke or not. So now based on the definition of environmental epidemiology, let's talk about the research topics uh, that are in the domain of environmental epidemiology. Epidemiology is one of the fields that seeks answers to environmental health questions such as those related to the domain of air pollution, climate change, chemicals, and water pollution. Air pollution continues to be a global public health issue. It is positively associated with increasing urbanization, especially in developing regions of the world. Recall three Ps, population, pollution, and poverty. When the population increases, government has to create job for this population and cut down the trees and build factories then that use fossil fuels and make air pollution. Uh, what is the role of environmental uh, what is the role of epidemiological studies in air pollution? The role of epidemiological research is to identify adverse health effects of air pollution among vulnerable groups such as children and uh, elderly. Another related concern in this category is the impact of exposure to tobacco smoke. Uh, another main research topic in environmental epidemiology is chemicals. The studies have shown that some toxic chemicals such as, such as pesticide, lead, and mercury are strongly associated with cancers because some chemicals are carcinogens. Uh, in other words, they can initiate cancer. Chemicals also have adverse impacts on nervous system and can cause numerous other health outcomes. Chemicals is a hot topic and a common research topic in environmental epidemiology that we will talk about that in uh, week number five.
the other research topic in uh, environmental epidemiology is climate change and uh, scientists have documented gradual increase in global temperature over past decades look at this picture it is it clearly shows a constant increase uh, in uh, global mean temperature this horizontal line is a a long-term average global temperature you can see after the year 1950 at uh, this point uh, global temperature progressively increased compared to the long-term uh, average so climate change is associated with extreme events for example heat wave in Chicago killed over 730 people in 1995 or flooding in coastal areas uh, uh, in endangers the life of animals or migration of the vector borne diseases from non endemic areas to endemic areas such as West Nile virus uh, in the United States uh, so we will talk about climate change and the effect of climate change in week number eight with more details so uh, what is the role of epidemiology here epidemiologists uh, epidemiological investigation will help us to evaluate the adverse effects of climate change and inform uh, policy decision in response to climate change the other research topic in environmental epidemiology is about potable water and potable water or drinking water has become increasingly scarce especially in the arid regions of the globe in some parts of the united states water supplies have also become compromised an example of contaminated potable water is because of the intrusion of lead into the public uh, drinking water in Flint, Michigan in 2014. The disaster occurred after officials changed the source of drinking water of Flint from Lake Huron to a less costly source of the uh, Flint River. So due to the aging pipelines, lead leached from water pipes into the drinking water exposing over a hundred thousand re residents to elevated blood lead levels and lead can cause adverse problems especially in the brain and kidneys uh, in this picture you can compare the water quality of detroit and uh, quality water of flint river so uh, now let's briefly talk about measuring disease frequency a very common purpose of epidemiological investigation is to estimate the frequency or count of disease in a population. This is of particular importance in the case of surveillance and disease monitoring systems. Uh, disease counts or the number of disease pa diseased patients at a point in time or over a period of time can be a useful measure for disease control and monitoring. Policymakers are commonly need to an estimation of disease frequency to disseminate information to the general public or uh, to decide where the resources is required to control or manage the disease. So uh, what do you think is the problem of count, disease count? For instance, consider two cities. City A has a large population and City B has a small, uh, is a small city, has a small population. Let's say uh, you have 100 Lyme disease cases in city A and 100 Lyme disease cases in the small city. If you just consider frequency or count, you can say both of them have the same number of Lyme disease and are equally important. So we have to allocate resources equally. While the situation is more serious in city B because higher proportion of people have been infected with the disease. So you cannot compare two locations only based on the disease count or disease frequency. It is not a reasonable comparison for management. So that's why we need to consider or take into account the population of the locations. So uh, today we're going to talk about two commonly used measures, namely prevalence and incidence uh, that are commonly used in the epidemiology. The first measurement that we're going to talk about is incidence let's see the definition of incidence the term incidence refers to the occurrence of new cases of disease within a defined period of time like a week months year or other time period 
So in the numerator, we only consider number of new cases occurred during the study period. And we exclude number of cases that are outside of the study period. And divide the numerator by population at risk or those members of the population who have potential of de developing the disease during the study period. So, uh, for example, for prostate cancer, we only put the population of male in the denominator and exclude the female population because only male have potential to develop the disease. So, uh, in calculating incidence, we only consider new cases of event uh, in the numerator during a study period and only population at risk in the denominator during the same study period. Uh, finally, to, uh, to avoid having a small value such as 0.002, we often multiply it by values like 100, 1000, 100,000. If you multiply the result by 1000, you should mm, say incidence per 1000. If you multiply the result by 100,000, you should say incidence per 100,000 and so forth. So uh, to better understand the concept of incidence, let's see some examples. In this figure, each line represents one patient and also the time they become sick and the time they recovered. Here is the starting time and here is the ending time for patient one. Starting time, ending time for patient two, start and and it's uh, here shows January 2000 and this line shows the December 2000. So what do you think the numerator of incidents can be during the year 2000? Uh, you can pause the video to think about it. So uh, the first one um, should not be included, the first patient should not be included in the calculation of incidents because it's not a new case during 2000, right? It was before uh, 2000. Uh, the second one, yes, uh, because it was a new case during the year 2000, so we should consider it as a new case. This one also is a new case. This one is not, this one is not. So uh, the numerator should be two. Another example of incidents uh, based on CDC report, CDC stands for Center for Disease Control and Prevention. There were 12 million people with diagnosed diabetes in US by year 2000. And among them over 1.1 million were newly diagnosed in the year 2000. Say a uh, total population of US is over 291 million in 2000. Calculate incidence of diabetes in the year 2000. So total number of diabetes is 12 million, right? And new uh, cases of diabetes is about uh, 1 million, right? And the total population is about 291 million. So let's look at the definition. Uh, incidence equals to number of new cases, which is 1 million, over population at risk. So the numerator is 1 million. But how about the population at risk? All, all people in US are at risk. Uh, it's not because diabetes is not gender specific or race specific. Everyone can develop diabetes. But 12 million people already had it. And 1 million are new cases that just got the diabetes. So we have to uh, subtract 12 from 2000 uh, from 291, mil 291 million and plus 1 million in the denominator. Okay, 291 million minus uh, 12 million plus 1 million uh, new cases. So uh, when you do the calculation, the results will be, and then multiplied by 1000 because it's very small number, we will get, uh, we will end up with 3.94% per per 1000 so we here you have to mention you shouldn't forget this unit because this is based on the 1000 multiply it by 1000 okay don't forget the unit so uh, you can also present the results um, per 10,000 if you multiply it by 10,000 it's gonna be 
39.4 cases. If you multiply it by 100,000, it's going to be 394. And if you multiply it by 1 million, it's going to be 3,940 cases. So the next uh, measurement is prevalence. The term prevalence refers to the number of existing cases of disease during the time period of T divided by the total population. So here the calculations are much simpler compared to the uh, incidence because we don't have any specific population group, just the total population. So uh, let's see uh, the same example we used for incidence. In this figure, each line represents one patient and also the time they, become, they became sick and the time they recovered, the start and end for, for patient one start and end for patient two and so forth. So what do you think the numerator of prevalence can be during the year 2000? So a numerator in prevalence according to the definition is number of existing cases during 2000. Patient one has the disease during 2000, right? During this period. Patient two, three, four, five. So all of them have the disease during 2000. So the numerator is five. So uh, the question is, how about the numerator in incidence? Only two new cases. Okay, so patient two and patient three. So incidence numerator will be two. So uh, let's look at the CDC example again. Based on the CDC report, there are 12 million people with diagnosed diabetes in US by year 2000. And among them, over 1 million cases are newly diagnosed in 2000. So uh, what is the prevalence of, of diabetes in uh, 2000? Unlike incidence, the prevalence calculation is very easy. Uh, number of existing uh, during time period during the 2000 and divided by the total population during 2000. So it's 12 million number of existing cases and divided by the total population, which is 291 million. And so it's super easy. When you multiply it by 1,000, you have to, uh, in the unit, you have to mention per 1,000. So uh, let's compare these two number, almost four, almost 41. So you can see that for chronic diseases such as diabetes, incidence and prevalence are very different, almost 10 times more than this one. But in some diseases such as acute uh, infectious diseases, they are very close to each other. The incidence and prevalence are very close to each other. And the reason is that they recover, the patient recovered in short time. So new cases and old cases are almost the same. And also, generally, they are not gender or age specific. Let's compare the characteristics of incidence and prevalence. Incidence indicates the risk of disease in a population or probability of someone in that population developing the disease or how fast the disease is occurring in a community. If you want to study causality, cause and effect, or the relationship between exposure to hazard and health outcome, Incidence is a better measurement because it excludes uh, the previously prevalent cases and only focuses on new cases. On the other hand, prevalence shows the burden of disease or proportion of the population who have been affected. And prevalence is used for public health planning such as budget, cost, and resource allocations. So uh, in the second module, we're going to talk about the most important study design in epidemiology like cross-sectional cohort and case control studies. In the literature, you may have seen phrases like this is a cross-sectional study design, this is a cohort study design, this is a case control study design. So you should be able to recognize their characteristics and pros and cons for each uh, study design. So uh, first of all, what is the purpose of a study design? The purpose of a study design is to determine if there is any association between a factor or exposure and a specific health outcome, disease or mortality. And if there is association, whether the observed association is a causal relationship or not, because association doesn't imply causation. For example, in this figure, you can see there is a positive association between ice cream sale and hot temperature. 
in hot temperature we have higher ice cream cell or they are uh, positively correlated but you cannot say ice cream cell is the cause of hot weather but the association between air pollution and uh, lung cancer is causality so a study design uh, help us to test the hypothesis of whether there is association between a factor and a specific health problem so uh, let's start with the cross-sectional study design the name uh, is self-explanatory the relationship between disease and factor is investigated at the same time or in a snapshot both factor and health outcome are investigated in a cross section or simultaneously so uh, the exposure and outcome are measured simultaneously at one point in a time it is called it is also called a snapshot study the measurement that we use in cross-sectional studies prevalence is not incidence uh, which is total number of cases divided by the total population and one of the most uh, common example of cross-sectional studies are health survey or questionnaire because they select a sample of people and ask people about disease and exposure in a particular time so uh, let's see an example of cross-sectional study so this is a self-report questionnaire uh, regarding lung disease and symptoms uh, from uh, children of children and their parents and this is an example of a cross-sectional study so uh, what are the advantages of cross-sectional studies it is first of all it is easy to conduct and it's kind of quick and inexpensive you need to select a sample that represent the population and then design questionnaire and uh, analyze it for example there are no follow-up for 10 years it is usually for a short time is a snapshot you can also measure multiple outcome and multiple exposure think about the uh, questionnaire you can ask so many questions of the factors uh, that they have been exposed and multiple uh, health outcome or disease how many diseases they have so uh, if you select a random sample that represents the status of society or community and uh, design a questionnaire for it it can represent a good picture of the status of disease in a uh, in the in that society you can measure prevalence and then you can generate hypothesis so cross-sectional study design are great for generating hypothesis however uh, there are also disadvantages for cross-sectional study design first it's the weakest study design compared to other studies design, like cohort and ca case control we can't investigate uh, causality in cross-sectional study you can only generate hypothesis and uh, data on all variables is collected uh, once it assumes that uh, variables are constant which is not a realistic assumption and doesn't uh, consider changes in both uh, factors and health outcome and it's not suitable for studying rare diseases it is with a short duration or rare exposure because in your sample for a short study period most likely there is no rare disease or rare exposure so it might uh, bias the results so now let's talk about the second study design or cohort study in cohort studies you select a group of people uh, individuals who were exposed to a factor and individuals who were non exposed to that factor then you follow them up for a period of time and uh, like several months or several years to see whether they develop disease or not and then you can calculate the incidence for each group so uh, let's see an example we're going to see whether there is association between uh, smoking and uh, heart disease coronary heart disease so we designed a cohort study and select a population of people who were exposed to a smoking uh, a smoking cigarette and also non-smokers in the year 2020 then we follow them up for uh, 10 years okay 
and after that we see that uh, for each group whether they developed heart disease or not and we can calculate incidence for both groups to make conclusion so uh, then we can create a table so we have exposed we have non exposed to cigarette and we have disease or heart disease and non uh, no heart disease okay no disease and then count the number of people for each category so people that were exposed and developed the disease people exposed didn't develop the disease uh, and so forth so then we calculate the incidence for the exposed group so for the exposed group the incidence will be the number of cases divided by the total population for the exposed group so it's going to be a divided by a plus b so that's the incidence rate for the non-exposed group uh, the incidence will be number of cases number of uh, sorry number of disease divided by the total population c divided by c plus d so and uh, if we divide incidence in exposed uh, to incidence in non-exposed we will have relative risk okay so incidence in exposed incidence in non-exposed and uh, the interpretation of relative risk is if relative risk uh, is one or close to one uh, it means that there is no association between the exposure to a factor and the disease or in this example there is no association between a smoking and heart disease because uh, incidence in exposed and non-exposed were equal if uh, relative risk is greater than one or large values uh, the larger shows the more strong relationship so and if relative risk is greater than one or a larger value uh, it means that the num numerator is greater than denominator right so or incidence in exposed is greater than incidence in non-exposed as you remember from previous module incidence shows the risk of developing the outcome so risk in exposed will be greater than risk in non-exposed also there is a positive association between the disease and exposure or uh, in this case there is a positive association between the smoking and heart disease and sometimes relative risk is less than one and it means that the denominator is greater than the numerator or incidence in exposed is less than non-exposed so uh, in that case we can say that there is a negative association uh, or risk in exposed is less than risk in non-exposed or the relationship probably is protective so that's the interpretation of the relative risk in uh, cohort studies so let's see a real world example smoking and uh, chd a hypothetical cohort study of 3000 cigarette smokers and 5000 non-smokers so we want to see is there any association between smoking and heart disease they followed them up for several years and then uh, they compared whether they developed heart disease or not and then they count the number of cases for that fall into each category so first we calculate the in the first step we should calculate the incidence among the exposed group so it's going to be 84 divided by the total which is 3000 right and also incidence in non-exposed group or non-smokers 87 divided by 5000 and then uh, just uh, do the ratio calculate the ratio incident exposed divided by incidence in non-exposed 28 divided by 17.4 which gives us 1.61 and uh, it is relative risk RR and relative risk is greater than 1 so how we can interpret this so we can say that uh, there is a positive association between a smoking and CHD or the risk of developing CHD is 1.61 uh, times greater in smokers compared to the non-smokers 
Uh, there are two types of cohort studies, concurrent and retrospective. If we ascertain the exposure and non-exposure at the beginning of a study and then compare incidence in future is concurrent or prospective cohort study. But if we ascertain the exposure and non-exposure in the past and then compare incidence at the beginning, it's retrospective cohort study. So uh, we are in the year 2020. If we ascertain the exposure and non-exposure today, and then we compare incidence in 2030, it's concurrent or prospective cohort study. Uh, if we assume the exposure and non-exposure occurred in, I don't know, 2015, and then compare the incidence today, it's uh, retrospective cohort study. So let's see an example. Uh, uh, example of a cancer and nuclear disaster. Uh, exposed population is defined as those who live 10 kilometers around the nuclear power plant and were free of cancer in 2011, so the exposed was in the past. Both exposed and non-exposed population are screened now to identify a cancer case. So what do you think about the type of the study design? It's a retrospective cohort study because there is a follow-up right and the exposure is compared after uh, almost 10 years so it's a retrospective cohort study and uh, now let's move on to the last study design which is case control study case control is kind of the opposite direction of cohort study but there are uh, no follow-up in the case control study design again we have two group of individual some are cases or individuals with diseases and controls individuals without disease or healthy people and then we interview them uh, to determine how many uh, were exposed and how many were not exposed in the past so let's see an example of case control study again association between smoking and heart disease we have two groups cases and uh, or di diseased and controls or no disease or healthy we can get the data from hospitals then we uh, interview them and ask them whether they smoked cigarettes or not in the past and then we calculate odds for cases and odds for control so uh, what is odds odds in cases is the probability that case was exposed and um, so here are the cases control exposed non exposed the probability that a case is exposed is a divided by a plus c and the probability that a case was not exposed so this was case not exposed was c divided by the total population of the cases which is a plus c so the odds for the cases will be this um, ratio and we, when we do the calculation it's going to be a divided by c so that's the odds that a case was exposed. We should also, uh, similarly, we should also calculate odds in controls, which gives us uh, B divided by D. And uh, then take the ratios between the odds. Okay, so we have to calculate odds ratio. And odds ratio is uh, odds that a case was exposed divided by odds that a control was exposed is a divided by c divided by b divided by d so which gives us a d over b c okay so uh it seems that the calculation is complicated but uh if you want to remember it simply remember it so odds ratio if you want to calculate odds ratio for case control studies very easy a d this multiplication divided by b c okay so it's the calculation is very easy and if odds ratio so the interpretation is very similar to the relative risk if odds ratio uh, is equals to one there is no association between exposure and outcome uh, because odds in cases and controls were equal and if odds ratio was greater than one means that the numerator is greater than denominator so odds in exposed is greater than non-exposed or there is a positive association and if odds ratio is less than one means that denominator is less than numerator 
or odds in exposed is less than non-exposed or negative association. For example, for the hypothetical example, if we do it for the case control studies, cases and controls, and then whether they're exposed, uh, sorry, uh, whether they're exposed and or non-exposed to the smoking cigarette. So uh, we count for each category, and then we can calculate the probability uh, based on the definition, and then calculate the odds, or we can simply use the uh, formula that AD divided by BC. So instead of doing this uh, calculations, right? So we can easily multiply 112 times 224 divided by 176 times 88, which end up uh, with 1.61. And again, it's greater than one, uh, so we can see that there is a positive association. The odds of exposure among cases of CHD is 1.61 times greater than the odds of exposure among control. So don't forget that the, in the case control studies you have to, is based on the odds ratio and uh, you have to compare cases and controls. Okay, so in the, in the cohort studies uh, it's not based on the case and control. Okay, in the cohort studies it's based on the risk of developing in exposed and non -exposed. So uh, the interpretation are slightly different. So here is a, an example for yourself to compare relative risk and odds ratio um, among cases and control, exposed or non-exposed, and make sure to interpret the results correctly. And here is a summary of the case control and cohort studies. So case control begins with exposure, non-exposure, but here start with cases and control. But for the case control studies, it's a disease and no disease. So uh, the measurement for cohort is based on relative risk and is more accurate. Here is based on the odds ratio, is less accurate. The time and cost is very long. So cohort studies sometimes is 10 years of study. They follow up for 10 years, so it's expensive. Uh, but here, case control is short time and definitely uh, relatively inexpensive. And uh, the major problem for court is loss to follow up. So uh, some people may die after 10 years. Uh, but uh, the major issue for the case control set is recall bias. So you ask them whether they exposed in past or not, or they may say, mm, I don't know, probably yes, probably not. So recall bias is a a uh, big issue in the case control studies.